Um, I'll, I'll kick this off. So, um, so first, uh, welcome everyone, and um, thanks for attending our session on applying a lean approach to building your product market fit. My name is Joe Kinsella. I'm a uh, Boston-based entrepreneur and investor. Uh, I'm best known for being the founder and CTO of a company called Cloud Health Technologies, which, um, which I grew from zero to over $100 million in ARR over about six and a half years, and uh, was acquired by VMware end of 2018. Now, when you hear someone like myself tell a story about their successful company, I'm sure um, you're like me, which is it's easy to assume that everything went right, that the founders had figured out the market, that they deeply understood their customers, the teams executed flawlessly and, and built a successful business. But the reality is, is that um, Cloud Health, like every other startup, uh, was a struggle every step of the way, from building a viable business to growing market share to just uh, managing through the uh, rapid growth phase that we encountered. But I'd say one of the biggest challenges in my entrepreneurial journey was the topic that brings us here today, product market fit. So as a one person business, I built the original MVP, I closed the first paying customers, I assumed uh, that I actually had product market fit as I went out and raised a series A round of venture capital. And uh, as we started to add people in and we started to grow the business, we quickly found that not only was it hard to close customers, but we were actually closing the ones that we did at substantially discounted prices. And so I like to diagnose what we had as an acute case of failure to achieve product market fit. And, uh, and that's the topic that brings us here today. So before we dive in, we have a great panel discussion and I, I, I brought on stage two other uh, great entrepreneurs so that we can have a lot of different diverse experiences to share. But I wanted to start with defining product market fit because there's a lot of definitions out there. So I define product market fit as the ability to repeatedly sell and deliver a value proposition within a target market with predictable success. And I choose my words very carefully here. So when I say repeatedly sell and deliver, many entrepreneurs assume product market fit is about product and features and functions. But product market fit is really about proving your entire business model, your end to end model from your ability to to prospect for the right customers, to bring them through a repeatable sales process where you close your fair share of deals, to your ability to actually su successfully deliver that value proposition to your customers and make them successful. The second phrase I wanna um, target is, is, is the word words target market, which is as entrepreneurs in startup people, we often target very broad markets. You know, In my case, I was trying to target both the mid market and enterprises that were using the public cloud. But the reality is, is when we start on the journey towards product market fit, we're targeting a subset of this. So I was personally targeting the CTOs, VPs of engineering and CIOs of mid market SaaS companies that were using the public cloud. And then the third phrase I want to focus on in this definition is predictable success. And, and I found over, over multiple times of doing this that it's best measured with deterministic business metrics. So you know, we often use the demand waterfall as a means to actually understand the uh, health of our ability to achieve product market fit. So that's, you know, a metric such as your, your conversion rate from MQL to SQL or SQL to trial or trial to close or your win rate. So one more time, I'm just going to repeat the definition and then we'll dive right in, which is product market fit is the ability to repeatedly sell and deliver a value proposition within the target market with predictable success. So with that, I want to dive right into our discussion. And I thought I'd, I'd jump right in and I'd bring the first of our founders in. Madeline, do you want to start by just, you know, tell us who you are and, and what your experience was in terms of driving towards product market fit? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, my name is Madeline. I am founder and CEO of Alma. Um, Alma is building a UI list collaboration tool that gives everyone in the company the power to be able to work through all different types of org wide problems that arise. And so within that, uh, we have started with a Slack native application that brings the whole organization together to route and resolve their technical incidents faster and be able to communicate out easier during an incident. My journey of finding product market fit came from living the problem of how to scale an organization well repeated over and over again and from embedding myself within one of our early design partners which really enabled me to live and breathe the pain in the product and expose just the reality of what we needed to build for companies so 
to go back before I go forward, early in my career, I, uh, I joined uh, Artsy, which at the time was an early stage tech startup in New York, where um, we grew very quickly. Um, and while it was exciting, it was also terrifying. Um, and as often happens, the number of incidents increased in frequency and complexity. And my role in that was very much gathering and sharing updates across different teams during an incident, um, drafting external communication to customers, navigating journalists' reach outs, deciding whether to push that marketing tweet or hold off um, really helped me understand the impact of incidents across the company and also a huge learning in realizing that technical incidents actually involve most uh, folks within the organization at this point. Um, and then just broadly, the difficulty of figuring out how to route and resolve all different types of organizational problems became so much more difficult as our company grew. And now departments were were functioning as departments versus teams. And what used to be such a simple question for me of who do I who do I route this customer bug report to became a very complex workflow and just working through all different types of problems from pro product launches to marketing language snafus and people issues became so much big, so much more complex as we scaled. And that was a huge moment of learning for me of just the sheer difficulty of collaborating on problems as you're growing very quickly. And after grad school, I actually ended up at a um, company called Bridgewater, uh, which is not a technology company, it's a hedge fund. Uh, but they had a very fascinating approach to routing and resolving organizational issues. And so I ended up going there and overseeing departments on behalf of the CEOs and working to route and resolve all different types of organizational wide problems using software that they had built internally for this and very much learning and getting my training on how do you bring the organization together to work through all different types of issues systematically at scale. And so left Bridgewater, kind of thinking back to younger me at, at Artsy being like, knowing what I know now, I'd love to help fast growing companies be able to work through all different types of problems and actually met Elias Torres, the founder and CTO of Drift pretty early on in my journey. Um, and he said to me, he was like, I love your vision. The pain point resonates just given the, the, the level of scale and growth that Drift was experiencing and is experiencing. And um, this really speaks to Elias and, and David Cancel and the Drift team. They incubated Alma. So they gave me office space and development funds and access to the team to be able to test many different workflows and products across their company and embarked from there on a series of pretty healthy cycles of iteration and learning from being with embedded within a company, which just gave our team access to such incredibly fast cycles of learning and feedback and the ability to really experience our product live and breathe and be used in an organization. So that helped us test and answer all sorts of questions such as, do we start with a vertical? Do we go with a horizontal program? It's a vertical, which vertical? How do we structure the initial product? And from there, we expanded our, our company base to triangulate our across multiple companies. And we really found technical incidents was this beautiful starting point for Alma because it was a concrete workflow that already had so much pain and therefore opportunity in it and already involved the whole company. So it was very much naturally coming together around this problem. And then our journey from there to product market fit just involved continuing this deep empathy driven product led growth approach to really preserve the level of feedback we'd experienced at Drift and then open the aperture and bring on a cohort of design partners. Um, and from that, we started working with um, all these fast growing startups experiencing lots of incidents and lots of pain and built a tool very much alongside them that addressed their needs and pain. And, in that, I would say we listened to them, truly listened, not just heard. And what we found was folks were just tired of standalone work tools that forced them out of their workflow. Um, they really were desperate for what good looks like around incident process, and they wanted the ability to easily and flexibly adapt a tool to their organization's unique operating style. So we built a tool that that does all of that. So today, Alma plugs directly into companies' existing tooling and process. So it's zero ramp time to adopt. And we built incident guidance straight into the product from working and learning from 300 engineering leaders on what good looks like. And we ensured that we built maximum flexibility and customization just to give teams complete autonomy. So we're now at this exciting inflection point where we found product market fit to Joe's point repeatedly and consistently seeing one engineer will install Alma into their Slack workspace and we just organically reach across the company and become the default adopted tool for their technical 
um, incidents. Um, and that's very much validated that initial thesis we have that incidents bring together the whole company, that chat is really the default UI for applications in today's working world, and that human collaboration is very much at the core of resolving org's problems. Excellent. Um, uh, Greg, you want to tell your story? Sure. Hey, everyone. Great to see you. Uh, great to be here. Can't see you. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Greg Garnett, I am the co-founder and CEO of a company called Cloud Truth. We're a, a seed stage startup in the Boston area. Our focus is on helping cloud and DevOps teams manage the uh, ever increasing complexity around configuring their cloud environment. That includes helping to centrally manage all the thousands of parameters, environment variables, and secrets that are instrumental in running a good cloud uh, backend operations group. A uh, little bit about my history. I've been a, a multi-time co-founder and CTO of several Boston area SaaS companies. Uh, cloud Truth is my latest project where I've um, co-founded with uh, Matt Conway, another Boston area CTO. And what we wanted to do with Cloud Truth was help DevOps teams manage this uh, issue that's emerging in the market right now in terms of um, the cloud is getting more mature and more capable, but configuration management is not getting any easier. So our approach is designed to coexist with a customer's existing implementations of their other tools. So we don't require a customer to fire a tool or hire us for the job. And that ties into the product market fit journey that um, I started about a year ago. So we're just now going from a pre-seed to a seed stage of our business. We have early adopter customers that are using our first version. And how we got there, I think, is a very interesting story that I'll relate as we talk uh, go through this session here. Uh, a couple of key things just to highlight um, as we go into the discussion is uh, in this particular space that we're in, the, the DevOps cloud tooling space, we saw so many uh, prior companies start off by focusing on a gut instinct that the founders had. That if the founders had this particular problem, they assumed everyone had that problem, and they would go off and build a solution and unveil it to the market and uh, it, it could be a dud. It wasn't, it wasn't built in touch with what customers really wanted. So with Cloud Truth, we had a, a prime directive to be as customer responsive and directed as possible, which means we ran a very thorough product market fit process. We, we treated it really like a sales motion in terms of top of funnel. We had goals on how many people we wanted to talk to, how many various uh, customer sizes and segments and horizontals and verticals. We really wanted to build a thoughtful, uh, thesis around the problem that we observed firsthand to make sure it really resonated with the wider audience and to Joe's point to get to that point where we can find uh, repeatability in terms of the value prop that we're delivering. Uh, so I'll, as we go through this discussion, I'll relay some of the lessons learned, how we got to this point in our time and uh, where we are headed in the future in terms of how the product market fit process now becomes the beginning of our growth stage. So we, we thoughtfully created a structure that could flip the switch from using our tactics to find people to talk to, to interview, to understand the pain points, to flip that switch and now find people to talk to, to sell the initial offering. Now, Greg, do um, you want to give a quick uh, plug for your blog post, which is you wrote a tremendous series of blog posts on product market fit. So you want to direct people where to find it? Sure. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's on our cloudtruth.com um, on the blog. Uh, just go to slash blog. Uh, there's a multi-part series that I wrote describing our product market fit process. Everything from the tools we use, the methodologies, the resources that we tapped, uh, you know, thought leaders in the space that we borrowed from. Uh, we ran a process called the ODA Loop Observe, Oriented, Decide, and Act, which is a military framework for decision making that was really helpful for us in terms of understanding what we're learning from interviewing potential customers and understanding their pain points to the um, how we take those learnings, incorporate them into our offering and iterate on that going forward. So yeah, check out the blog post series. It's very informative. Excellent. So Madeline, maybe we can start with you, which is I, I love to start instead of on the success side, the failure side. So if you don't mind, um, uh, what were one of the top, like the top one or two mistakes you made? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the top two. So the first one is do not over index on the success of one organization. Um, so you can't just talk to one design partner, even if you're, you know, living closely within them, you need to be able to be triangulating with a sampling to have real data. Um, and that way you're also careful to not build too custom to an organization's processes and cultures and behaviors. And so one thing that I should have done is I should have opened the aperture sooner in that regard and started triangulating faster with other companies. Um, and then the second thing that comes to mind is 
Um, as a founder, you need to take yourself out of the process and out of the product as much as possible um, and distance yourself. So not over indexing on yourself as founder, because as a founder, you likely have a ton of charisma and passion for what you're working on. And when you're working with design partners in the early days, um, and especially embedded in a design partner, you can push the, the product along and influence behavior to create false positives. So you, you have to really guard rail against this and as much as possible distance yourself that's excellent so greg what are what are your top one or two mistakes i think um i would summarize that as we reacted to so in the in the process of interviewing people to understand what their pain points are and the, the particular focus area that we are choosing which is the devops cloud tooling space uh, you can lead the witness to a false conclusion and that's one thing we are very highly allergic to is uh, we wanted to avoid getting a false positive and um in our early days, we interviewed probably 50 different cloud and DevOps leaders at mid-sized companies. We'd already scoped out that our, our entry point was going to be uh, medium-sized organizations that were dealing with some scale or complexity issues on the cloud. Uh, companies too early or too small wouldn't have the problem we're designed to solve, and very large organizations have the problem, but as a new company, we wouldn't be able to meet their security requirements and so forth. So we focused initially on an ideal customer profile of mid-market. We spoke to about 50 folks in that space. We thought we were getting some strong signal on a problem that they were having. Uh, we went off and built a solution to address that problem. Uh, it turned out it wasn't the right, it wasn't right what it wasn't what people were really asking for. So we reacted too early to false signal. Uh, we did that and, and I'll say we did it early enough where we could course correct. So it wasn't like we had to do a pivot and and so forth. We knew we were going to be doing some iterations. We knew we were going to be doing experiments with uh, different offerings we could put in front of an audience to get feedback. And we thought we had we thought we had the signal, but it turned out it was a false signal. Um, so we detected that early enough and re revamped, and and now here we are. I think, uh, uh, Greg, I kind of had a similar story myself, which is I, I like to tell people that if wisdom comes from failure, I'm a very, very wise person, which is uh, I've made almost every mistake you can make along the journey of getting to product market fit. But one of the mistakes we made was I honestly, sincerely thought as, you know, as the founder and creator of my product, I thought I had product market fit when I really didn't. And, and we, you know, I, you know, we started to actually bring in the next set of people and we started to kind of put the, you know, turn the volume knob up on the growth engine. In many ways, it's like for anybody who saw Tom, uh, Tom Eisenman talk yesterday, he has these six patterns in his book and one of them is called the speed trap. And, uh, and I, I fell victim to a, a, a small version of that. And we course corrected fairly quickly once we realized it, but but we thought we were ready to start to grow. And then we realized there was much more to product market fit than we thought. In fact, for me, it came down to this really pivotal meeting where I had one of my early customers call me up and say they wanted to go to lunch. And, and I went and I met them at lunch. And then um, this CIO proceeded to basically tell me that my baby was ugly and that I had failed to deliver on uh, the value proposition that I had sold him on. And, uh, you know, and as a founder, you take that very personally. And, um, you know, and I was, I was somewhat crushed, but, uh, but I looked him in the eyes at the end of the conversation. And I said, I said, Bill, will you work with me to fix this? And he just looked at me completely, uh, you know, surprised. And he said, Joe, what the hell do you think I'm telling you this for? And uh, over the next few weeks, we managed to drive through his issues. And as it turned out, it ended up being the last step in achieving our product market fit. And if you go back to one month after that meeting, you could actually see the, the rapid growth that Cloud Health experienced for, for, for most of its lifespan actually started the month after that conversation. So, um, so awesome. let's jump into the success side, which is, uh, Madeline, why don't you tell us, like, what, like, what did you get right in your journey towards product market fit? Yeah, I'd point to a few things. Um, building within an ideal customer uh, really, truly enables you to live and breathe the pain and just experience the reality and, and also expose yourself to the inevitable delta of what you think you need to build versus what you actually need to build. And the outcome of that is that you just have much faster cycles of learning and iteration. So it actually speeds up the process of finding product market fit. Um, and then the other thing was uh, our, the ability to preserve those cycles of learning even while expanding our design partners. And the way that we did that was through um, 
building very tight feedback loops. So we have office hours consistently with our customers. We have Slack connect channels with every single one of our design partners where we're consistently getting feedback and going back and forth with them. We have a Discord. We have community events where we bring people together. We, we run an event called Battle Scars and Beers, which is a very casual event where um, folks come and share memorable incident stories and learnings. And we ourselves learn so much just by listening to those various stories. So really consistently seeking out our customers' needs and pain and looking across our customers to expose signals and patterns and then mapping those to our North Star to, to ensure we're consistently defining and redefining our roadmap. And then the final thing is being disciplined and capital efficient while figuring out product market fit. That's something we did for the longest time Alma was a one to two person company for a very, very long time. And while that was excruciatingly painful at many points, um, it also ensured that we were able to definitively, definitively find product market fit and then position ourselves really nicely to add fuel from there. Excellent. I, Madeline, I don't know if you noticed in chat, someone gave a shout out to um, uh, David and Elias uh, at Drift for uh, supporting the local ecosystem. So Amazing. Yeah, they definitely should get that shout out. And it's also a dream of mine to build Alma to a point where we are incubating the next generation of founders. That would be incredible. Outstanding. So, so Greg, what, what did you get right instinctively as you went down the process? Uh, yeah, that's a it's a great question. We could write tomes around this um, and look forward to the breakout session we'll have after this a group chat. Uh, a couple things come to mind is we initially identified a vision that would be called platform esque and uh, a multi set of functionality that could be delivered uh, with initial entry point to the organization and then other constituent audiences we could serve beyond our initial ideal customer profile. Uh, but these days you can't go off and build a platform in the dark and then unveil it to the world and expect phenomenal success. You really have to be building with customers from day one or day zero. And so we identified a, a wedge set of functionality that could be our beachhead into the market. And that's where we focused our efforts on the initial product market fit. So we were duly testing the big vision that we had, uh, the compelling reason why a customer would want to use Cloud Truth to manage their uh, cloud infrastructure provisioning, app config and secrets management. We really wanted to focus and narrow our surface area uh, to something that was achievable to get done within our pre-seed timeframe. So uh, what we got right is we had the, uh, the platform vision, but we started off with a, with a wedge kind of concept and the wedge was designed to prove out we could serve one, solve one problem for one uh, customer profile. And we knew there were enough adjacent audiences that had a similar problem that we could branch and, and use that beachhead to go off and upsell into the current customer or have a, uh, a, a wider surface area of offerings to attract a, a larger initial customer audience. Uh, other things we got right are, we were very deliberate in terms of how we ran the product market fit process. I mentioned earlier, we treated it like a sales, uh, like a sales motion. So we recorded all the interviews. Uh, we were very successful in how we attracted people to give us feedback. I've done over now 500 uh, Zoom interactions, typically a 45 minute to an hour meeting with a prospect that was so gracious to donate their time to give us uh, their thoughts and insights, uh, feedback on what we're thinking about. We recorded all those. We used various tools to run them through AI analyzers to figure out what do we learn from those conversations. Um, they're a huge knowledge asset now that we have to go back and look at our prior learnings as we make future decisions around functionality. What did we learn from a specific customer in a particular market size or, or vertical or a segment that uh, we have interest in knowing about? So I think uh, if you have a platform vision, narrow down your initial offering to a wedge and uh, be very methodical about how you run your product market fit process. Be the two things that we're, we're That's great. And I think for me, I'd add one more thing, which is um, it, it kind of goes back to Madeline's point around the, taking the founder out of the process, which is I'm a big believer in markets over products, which is too many times I think entrepreneurs like see an idea, kind of have a better mousetrap, and then just focus on how they can actually bring that to market and build a business around that. And markets always trump products in my experiences. So if you can actually start with a broad market and then run your experimentation within that broad market, keep an, an open mind as much as possible towards where the biggest market opportunity is. I find it's, I call it telescoping instead of pivoting because pivoting's hard. It, you know, causes a lot of angst. It burns burns money. It, 
you know, it's uh, very difficult for your people, but telescoping is less hard. It uh, allows you to actually land on the right value proposition over time by an iterative process. So, so that's one I would add. And, and maybe I'm just um, compensating for my own weaknesses, which is I love product ideas. And so I instinctively gravitate to them and want to go build businesses around them. So, um, so with that, I'd li like to move into the next question. And um, uh, if I can uh, fire it back to you, Madeline, which is, you know, how did you, um, you know, we all know that no single product market journey applies to every business. So how did you have to adapt your process to the specific needs of either your business or your customers? Yeah, um, consistently uh, and often. So, <laughs> um, so I mean, we all have an ambitious vision, right? Like we want to build this organization-wide UI list collaboration tool that brings everyone together to work through all sorts of problems that happen in a, in a company. And so the one of the things we needed to do to adapt uh, was to scope to a very clear starting workflow. So that gets to um, what Greg was describing as well of, of making sure that we defined a clear vertical and a use case to begin with, um, and that also within it a clear who. And that came from, you know, the if you're trying to build everything for everyone to start, you end up building nothing for, for no one. And so for us, technical incidents with a focus on engineering teams as our primary entry point and our primary um, buyer and user uh, really came came to be um, and helped us adapt to our process and our our, our product uh, to the specific needs of our market. And then I would say underneath that, once we had defined and scoped out a clear vertical workflow and a clear who, you have to then adapt to how they like to be engaged with and how they like to work. And so for engineers who love, you know, designing and building systems, um, you know, as we were thinking about who do we bring on as design partners and how the opportunity to help us design and build a system for a very deep pain for them resonated deeply. Um, and that was how we started engaging with them. And then the mechanisms to um, go where they are already working, go where they prefer to communicate and work and engage. And for us, that's places like Slack, that's places like really casual events that bring people together in their community, that's office hours, and really just trying to find those methods of engagement um, driven by your, your who. Excellent. So, Greg, how did you adapt your product market journey towards in your process towards your customers in your market? Yeah, there's um, a couple of thoughts here. So our initial target uh, profile is a DevOps leader at a mid-sized company. And DevOps is historically challenging to sell to, right? You have the competition of open source. Um, there's almost an allergic reaction that DevOps people have to a salesperson trying to do outreach and so forth. So we tried various tactics to uh, come across as not being salesy because we really weren't, but I think their DevOps folks are sort of tuned or um, programmed to react in that same way, even if it comes across as being salesy, even, even though we weren't. Uh, we were using things like LinkedIn and other outreach methods to get in contact with folks that we didn't have in our first degree network. Uh, so knowing that DevOps folks are historically hard to inter interact with, uh, especially if you want to try to schedule a live, live meeting versus trying to do something over over chat or um, text or that kind of thing. Uh, we did adapt to make it as friendly and easily as possible. Uh, we also benefited from uh, some lessons I learned in a book called The Mom Test, which is a, uh, a book that describes how to describe your offering in a way that doesn't get a false positive. It's sort of like, I'll, I'll, that's a high level summary that I'll part. There's a lot of other great insights in that book. Um, so that was some lessons learned there that helped us think about our outreach method and what we wanted to try to accomplish during those interactions to get someone to donate half an hour to 45 minutes of their time is hugely valuable. So we wanted to make the most out of that. And uh, so resources such as the mom test and other books that we used um, regard guardrails around this process. It's um, it's it's challenging to uh, sort of interface with that particular audience segment. They're not they're not necessarily prone to like wanting to be uh, extrovert and talk to lots of different people. Um, the other thing that we heard in our research and the feedback, we started to describe in more specifics what we're planning to do. So this is like our second and third phase of the product market fit process. We went through the first phase, which is at the 30,000 foot level, are we in the ballpark? Is there some problem to solve at this level? Then we took it down to 10,000 feet and then we got down to like ground level. We're actually showing prototypes and getting feedback and so forth. 
we kept hearing this common theme, which is, um, uh, I'll, I'll attribute it, there's an axiom that's often attributed to Henry Ford, which is, uh, if you asked his first customers what they wanted, they said they would have wanted a faster horse, right? They couldn't anticipate the, uh, the, the popularity of the automobile at that stage because it wasn't really even out there. And what we are describing to DevOps practitioners is that same kind of light bulb moment. We hear this theme of, wow, I didn't think what you're doing was possible, but now that I see this, it really makes a lot of sense. And that sort of lighted up uh, with us in terms of, okay, as, as we're gonna message this new type of capability, customers may not be out there actually looking for it, but once they become aware of it, they actually, it resonates with them. So that influenced our thinking about how we wanna go to, go, uh, go to go market and configure the uh, functionality to be sort of product-led growth and that kind of theme. So those are some thoughts that come to mind on that topic. So Greg, if you don't mind me firing a question from the chat at you, which is uh, Venkata um, has a question where he says like tech entrepreneurs are not necessarily great at communicating. So should you go find a marketing expert to help communicate with the customers and conduct the interviews, et cetera, or do you do it yourself? And, you know, as a fellow geek, I figured you'd be a good person to answer this. Uh, great question. Uh, so this ties into the synergies that I have with my co-founder, Matt. Uh, Matt is the the technical wizard. He's uh, kind of inward facing and focused on what the product can do. And I complimented him nicely as being the outward facing uh, spokesperson for the company and the ability to engage with a wide variety of technologists in a friendly, collaborative way. Um, if we didn't have that complementary skill set, I think you would need as a as a as a very technical founder someone who can be a facilitator for the discussion if that doesn't come naturally to you because you want to take advantage of that precious amount of time that that other parties donating to your cause and benefit from that as much as possible. So you, I think you do need a little bit of extrovert kinds of qualities to be successful in this and whether you need to bring that in as a as an additional resource or you can develop that skill yourself. Um, that's going to be valuable to you. That's a good answer. Um, and so for me, in terms of how I adopted um, uh, my process uh, to, to my customers and my market, I kind of mentioned it in my intro, which is my, my vision was that I was solving a, a set of cloud management problems for all customers that were going to use the public cloud. But what I found is, is that um, the big hypothesis, the big bet I was making is, is that enterprises would adopt. And to be honest, it sounds obvious now, but in 2012, I was rejected by almost every venture capital firm in Boston. And the rejection was really driven around a belief that enterprises would not adopt the public cloud at scale. In fact, I had a number of um, notable Boston um, investors who suggested to me that I go build my solution for the private cloud. And, uh, and so I ran an experiment, I called it the Wall Street experiment, where I wanted to prove out that there really was not a verticalization, that, 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 that there was really just early adopters, early majority adopters, late adopters, et cetera, and that if I built the right value proposition for the early adopters, it would flow downhill to all the other um, uh, you know, uh, later adopters. And so the Wall Street experiment I ran, I designed it around proving or disproving that hypothesis. I proved that, that hypothesis. And that's what led me actually to go focus on um, SaaS companies, which is I did that with some amount of confidence. I'll admit there was still a leap of faith moment there where I, I was assuming that this would actually transpire. And, and you know, the good news it did. And you know, that's, that's really what propelled our growth is, is that, that we were able to grow beyond uh, SaaS companies to appeal to enterprises in mid-market and, and channel partners. Um, so we're, we're kind of reaching the end before we get to our uh, panel discussion. So Madeline, maybe you could, uh, you know, if there's one pearl of wisdom, if everyone hears us talk for 40 minutes and they just walk away from one thing that you want them to know, what would that be? Um, so I, it would be assume you're getting it wrong or that you do not know. And so the entire goal of the, the journey to product market fit or just generally company building um, from my perspective is to speed up the process of validating what you're wrong about and what you do not know in order to increase the probability of getting it right. So really focus on learning what you're doing wrong, what assumptions you're holding that are incorrect, what biases and blind spots you have, what you don't know and what you don't know you don't know, um, so that you can just get to truth faster. Um, so that would be my biggest learning. And then the way to do that, that sits underneath, is as a founder working to get to product market fit, you should be spending the majority of your time with 
your perspective in current customers. So, you know, at least 70% of your time. And one thing I found very helpful to actually hold yourself accountable to that is to measure it on your calendar. So I will um, consistently do an audit of my calendar to ensure that, that the time I am spending actually reflects the time I should be spending. That's great. So Greg, what's your one pearl of wisdom that you'd pass on to everybody? Uh, I'll, I'll focus on the uh, the tools that we use to run our product market fit process. So initially I had thought I would need, so first let me take a step back, is uh, our first pass at product market fit, my co-founder and I used our direct first, first jury connections on LinkedIn to identify people that we think would give us feedback that would be helpful. So we went through that and that worked out great. But beyond that, then we had to contact people that didn't know us um, you know, any, from any perspective. And so I was imagining um, using various tools like Zoom Info and Discover Org and Outreach. And you know, there's lots of great sales and marketing tools that become very expensive over time to help me find the people I needed to speak with. And I got some advice from another uh, entrepreneur who was doing a similar uh, product market fit motion for a, a sales related uh, SaaS tool. And um, he looked at what I was planning to do. I hadn't kicked, I haven't actually pulled the trigger on just subscribing to those services. Um, he said, you're, you're way, way over indexed on technology. Here's what you need to do. Uh, LinkedIn, Sales Navigator, and then that, that becomes your way of finding people to talk to. And as an uh, avid LinkedIn user, I'd seen Sales Navigator, but never really knew what it was because I wasn't in a sales role. I didn't have any need for Sales Navigator before. But once I understood what Sales Navigator could do for me, um, it was a very low cost add on. I think it's like 80 bucks a month that gave you a, a lot of great targeting tools right within LinkedIn that one would not need to then go to another tool like a Discover Org or Zoom Info to find um, the DevOps leader at mid-sized companies, 500 and one employees up to a thousand, right? That kind of targeting kind of stuff. Uh, so we got a very streamlined tech stack to run the product market fit process. It was LinkedIn, Sales Navigator, Zoom, Google Drive, excuse me, Google Drive, and uh, we added Otter to uh, process our um, transcripts and get um, analysis of the words and the phrases and that type of thing. So uh, keep a simple, lightweight tech stack and a product market fit process. You want to go uh, a mile wide and an inch deep. You want to talk to as many people as, you, as possible in your target segment. You don't specifically care for it's a, if it's a specific company, not like account-based marketing or account-based sales where you want to get into a targeted company. You want to go as, as wide as you can and go an inch deep. And those are the right tools to do that. And, and then one other note is I sent a personal thank you gift and note to every person I spoke with, uh, a handwritten note. And uh, that worked out really well. Just it created a little bit of a relationship. Uh, thank you. A thank you note to the thank you um, was often reciprocated and uh, cemented in the, the fact that we had a great interaction with that um, participant. Excellent. Hey, Madeline, if I can just hit you with a question in chat, if you can give a quick answer to that, which is just any advice on how to handle a, you know, a situation where you have interest both from SMBs and enterprises as you're trying to figure out where to target for product market fit? Yeah, so this comes back to starting with clear scope. So you should have a sense as a founder of who you are targeting at first. And by and large, that is probabilistically not both SMBs and enterprise customers in your earliest days um, because you just don't have the resources or the product that functions and fits both stages at that point. So start with knowing your goal um, and choose between the two. And then within that, I would say um, one healthy way of ensuring that you're building the aperture and the path forward to both is ensure you're serving that core segment. So if you've chosen SMBs, you should be focusing on spending your time with those people, building product that actually fits those needs, designing pricing and sales and go to market motions that align with those, that group, and maybe one step forward with a design partner that is slightly larger with them so that they will give you the compass of what to do next. Um, and, and then underneath that, then if you're getting interest, from both, that's awesome. Congrats. Um, and then I would, I would basically say use the other one as learning and compass and north star, while being very transparent and realistic about what is possible today. That's great. Great advice. 
So uh, what I'd like to do next is uh, go into breakout rooms. So the breakout rooms will consist of up to five people. So we'll break into numerous breakout rooms. I think there's probably uh, too many people for us to report the results from every breakout room. So, so I want to ask you to do the following, which is when you get in your breakout room, um, introduce yourself. So it's a great opportunity to meet new people. And then the homework I'd like to give you is work together to identify the top two mistakes that you think um, you want, you would advise people to avoid in the march towards product market fit. And since we won't be able to report all the results, uh, what I'd like you to do is have have one person just report that in chat. And then um, Greg, Madeline, and I will try to um, just kind of talk through some of the top top mistakes and, and maybe share some of our experiences. 